Well, good morning. morning. How are y'all doing? It's funny, um, you know, on Sunday mornings, I get here and um, and some mornings are, are just great and smooth, and then some mornings, you know what's breaking loose. And, uh, and so this morning was one of those mornings I got here and we had no internet through the building. And in 2020, it is hard to operate without internet, if you don't know. Um, all of our kids' stuff runs off the internet, and we're still working on that right up to the last time, and then uh, people joining us online. They would not be able to join us online uh, without internet, and so uh, luckily we were able to get that up and running, and, uh, and so I, I, I say those things um, that, to say this, um, and if you're, you're joining us for the first time, um, we believe in, uh, in, in that the devil works against us, uh, and we believe that he's for some reason, has been working hard this morning uh, to, to keep us from, from having church. And so, but as you can see, um, we're not going to stop. If my mic doesn't work, I'll just yell. Because whether y'all know it or not, I don't really need the mic. Uh, it's just, just for uh, recording purposes. But, uh, but we've been actually spending the last six weeks declaring war um, on our worst enemy. And that's ourselves. Uh, we are our own worst enemy. And so if you haven't been here, I want to give you a quick recap. The first week, we just kind of just kind of laid the groundwork and said, hey, we're our worst, own worst enemy, and we got to name, name our worst enemy, and we got to claim it, and we're going to say we're going to defeat them. And then week two, we started getting into what we're actually declaring war in our, in our minds, uh, and we started declaring war in our thoughts. And we said, you are what you think. And so if you think bad thoughts, guess what? You're going you're gonna to be bad, right? If you think good thoughts, you, you can be good. And so, and then... Week two, or week three, actually, we, we declared war on what comes out of our mouths. And Lord knows I need that. Um, and I still need to declare war on that. And we said uh, that sticks and stones may, may, may break my bones, but ultimately words can hurt because our words matter. And then uh, week four, Pastor Tanner uh, spoke on our actions. And he said our, our, new, uh, our, our new activity comes from our new identity and our identity found in Christ. And then last week, we started this two-part series to kind of end this talking about how do we win the war and so we're going to finish that today and we're going to talk about how we win the war giving practical ways to win the war some battle plans some tactics that we can put in place and so have you ever had a time in your life have you ever known a time in your life or thought of a time in your life or maybe someone else's life where you've done 80 percent of the work and kind of left that 20 percent undone like like you've done uh, almost all it takes to get done and that extra 20% just, just kind of laid there. It just kind of sat there. Well, back in the 1930s, a guy by the name of Walt Disney, you've probably heard of him, uh, had an idea that he was going to take uh, Hans Christian Andersen tales, uh, writings, uh, stories, and make them into movies, make them into animated movies. And he was thinking through this, and he was going through this, and he decided uh, one of the tales that Hans Christian Andersen wrote called The Little Mermaid was a little too dark for... Uh, for, for their viewing audience. It was a little too kind of suspicious. And um, if you go back and you read the original Little Mermaid, you will understand why Walt Disney thought this. It, it's not a pretty picture. It's, it's not the nice little uh, fairy tale that we have come to know here in, in, in our world now. Um, and so Walt Disney decided on other classics that we know is like Snow White. Uh, everybody ever heard of that movie? You've seen that movie, uh, and so uh, and so uh, and so so he decided on those. But but flash forward to 1985, a guy by the name of Ron Clements pitched the idea of an adapted script to the powers that be at Disney, and he said, "Hey, I think this could work. We'll do it in an animated film." But the powers that be that Di- uh, the powers that be at Disney said, "Look, animation is dead. We're not doing any more animated films." We're not going to have these animated films where all these people are sitting around and we turn them into movies. We're not going to do that anymore. And besides, it's 1985. Just a year ago in 1984, there was this movie about a mermaid coming to life and falling in love with this human, with this little actor by the name of Tom Hanks. Maybe y'all have heard of him. It's called a movie called Splash. And, and, and so they're like, there's no way this could work. But Ron didn't give up. He said, look, I got 80% of the script done, and I'm going to get that other 20% done, and then I'm coming back. And he came back, and obviously in 1989, we know the rest of the story, right? Right? Like, we know the story of the Little Mermaid, because we've gotten such classics like Under the Sea. Under the Sea. Y'all know that one? 
under the sea. I would sing more, but I don't remember it. And no, y'all don't want me to sing more. But, but like, kiss the girl. Like, la, 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 la. Kiss the girl. Like, come on. Like, like that's, those were classics. Like, when I, I was uh, 11 in 19, or 10 in 1989. And, um, and that was a classic back then. For, for my 10-year-old self. But, but think about, like, like, think of what wouldn't have happened. The movies that came after The Little Mermaid, if we'd have just said, eh, I, I'm good. If Ron Clement would have just said, okay, I got 80% done. I, I'm not, uh, you know, they said no. They told me, no, we're not doing animated films anymore. Y'all do realize what came after The Little Mermaid, right? Like Aladdin. There's some other ones like, in there. And, and, and so, and think of like what Disney would have missed out all on. Just 233 million from that movie alone, let alone some of the other ones, right? Like, think about that. Like, 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 and I know some of us have probably done something 80% of the way, and, and, and either we've given up or it's fizzled out. And, and, and look, I, I don't think we do that on purpose. Like, when we start something out, like, we're, we're intending to, to finish, aren't we? Like we're intending to get to the end. We, we don't want to fizzle out at 80%, but yet we do. And, but here's the thing, and let me just tell you, it's in that 20% that a lot of times is where the breakthrough comes. It's in that 20% is, is, is where the strongholds are, are broken down. It's in that 20% that, that where we find the, the winning. Think about this. For those of you that are married, or those of you who inspired to be married one day, Think about this. Think about if, if you stand uh, in front of the church that you're getting married at or the place you're getting married at with the pastor that's there and the people that are there, and in your vows you said, I vow to give 80% to this marriage. Like the person you're standing across from is like, excuse me. Like, uh-uh, you ain't giving 80%, right? Right? Or, or think about when, if you call yourself a Christian, you call yourself, and when you gave your life to Christ, if you said, you know what, God, I'm going to give you 80%. Like, like, we don't do that, do we? And look, I am thankful that Jesus didn't do that. I am thankful that Jesus didn't give 80%. Because isn't that last 20% that he gave to us is where the breakthrough comes. And so I believe that the hardest things that we can do is start. But it's even harder to stay in it and to finish. It takes grit. And it takes determination to finish. And that's what propels us to victory. That's what propels us to victory. Check out this verse in Hebrews 12. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. And that's what we're talking about, running with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Uh, if you have your Bibles, underline that verse, highlight that part of it. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition for sinners, so that, and this is where it's, where it's important for us right here, this, this so that is for me and you. It says, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's the reason why, why, why when we read this, it says, the joy set before God. It's the joy set before him. He endured the cross. It's, it's that so that. It's so that you and I can finish. It's so that you and I can find life in that 20 extra percent. Second Timothy, Paul was writing Second Timothy as Paul was nearing the end of his journey in life. And he was telling him this. He was nearing the end of his, his, his ministry. And he says, for I am already poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. And he says, I've fought the good fight. I finished the race, and I've kept the faith. Now, I don't say this to discourage you. I don't say this to, um, to, to be a bummer, but our goal is to win this war, right? Our goal is to win the war. But the war will not be over until you are on the other side of eternity until you're standing face to face with Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you will continue to fight this battle in, in, in your life. 
You will continue to wage war. That's why we talked about last week. Hey, look, you need to set yourself on fire, but you need to carry a box of mat- matches around with you to keep setting yourself on fire. Because it's, it, you got to keep doing it. You got to keep staying in it. And so I'm going to give you today just some very practical things to continue winning. And so I'll tell you this. Here's the first thing you got to do. You got to starve your fear and you got to feed your faith. You got to starve your fear and feed your faith. Starve your fear, feed your faith. We did this series a couple, we did a series a couple months ago called Routines, the Power of Routine. We talked about how there's power in, in setting routines in your life, setting things in your life that, that are daily, that are, that are things that you put in. And putting these routines uh, not only just helps you in your walk with Jesus, but just helps you in your daily life. Helps you to grow in your faith. So I would ask you, if, if you've been here for those, how are you doing? How are your routines? How, how are they going? Because I believe the reason we get defeated is because we lose these routines in our life. And we just go with the flow. Like, life throws us a left and we just take it. Boom. You know? It throws us an uppercut and we just take it. Boom. And we come right back and we think nothing's wrong and we just keep going. So what we have to do is we got to figure out what our trigger points are. We got to figure out where we're getting beat up, where we're constantly going back to that's causing us to stumble. I'll give you a couple examples in my life. Um, a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago, um, I, I noticed one day I was, I was got, grab my phone and I'm sitting there going, I go on Facebook, I'm sitting there scrolling and what intends, you intend to be like a five minute journey on Facebook turns into like a 45 minute hour long journey. Terrible. I, I know um, and so I'm sitting there and, and towards the end of it, I, I just, it's like you wake up, something like slaps you like, or a light bulb goes off and you're like, I was like, man, I feel terrible. Like I've sat for the last 45 minutes reading political things and how people hate this people group and how people hate this people group. And I'm just like, oh, so I said, I got to turn it off. I, I got to quit. I got to, because I was just like, oh. Like, is this really how we, like, oh, it's terrible. So I just said, nope, I'm not going to do Facebook for a while. So I got off of there, refreshed me. I, I, I've been back on some, but I'll limit it. I'll give you another example, Instagram. Obviously, you guys know what Instagram is. Um, I was sitting there scrolling one day, and I, I went to search for something, and all these pictures come up. And I'm like, what, what are these pictures on here for? Like, I don't want to see these pictures. So I look at Tanner, I'm like, hey, dude, how do you get these pictures off? And he's like, I don't know, you must have searched for something. I was like, well, I ain't searching for that. <laughs> I promise you that, I ain't searching nothing for that. And so I, I, and he's like, I don't know, that's why I don't go to Instagram anymore. And so I go home and ask my daughter, who's a teenager, how do I get these off? Because I don't want them. And she's like, I don't know, not, that didn't pop up on mine, Dad, so I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so I go to my wife, how do I get these pictures off? I don't want to see them. So she searches on her phone how to, you know, get rid of these searching. So I have to go through and like literally block everything on there. And I did. But I had to find those trigger points that, because I don't, I don't want to see those things. I don't want to be involved in those things. So, so you've got to starve your fear. You, you've got to starve it. That means you can't go back to it. So what, what's your fear? Is it social media? Some of you... It might be. Is it the news? For the next two weeks, it probably is. Is it your phone? Just your phone in general. Did you know that 60% of people uh, charge their phone right next to their bed? And it's the first thing they pick up when they wake up. It's the last thing they look at when they go to bed. 60% of people. Maybe you need to charge your phone in a different room. But it's my alarm clock. Yeah, they still make the other alarm clocks that have the little blinking lights. Maybe your TV needs to come out of your room. You got to find, figure out what your fear is. What causes you to, to have this? What, what causes you these, 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 this war inside of you? Maybe it's the potato chip aisle at the grocery store. Maybe you need to make yourself a grocery list. And only buy those things on the grocery list. I know if I go to the grocery store without a grocery list, I I stay a long time on the potato chip aisle. Ooh, two for five. Yeah, let me get six of them. You know? Like you have to starve your fear. Starve 
your fear? What's the roadblock that keeps you trapped? And next, you got to feed your faith. Feed that faith. Feed your faith. Feed your faith. Starve your fear. Feed your faith. And let's camp out here just for a second on our, what we're talking about here, our thoughts and our words and our actions. How do we feed our faith to control our thoughts and our words and our actions? How do we feed that thing? Well, anybody ever heard the old adage, garbage in, garbage out? Right? If you put bad things in, what's going to come out? Bad things, right? And so, so we're sitting here wondering, I said this last week, we sit here and wonder why we can't sleep. It's because we've just binge watched, you know, The Walking Dead. And for the last six hours, we've watched people eat, eat other people's faces off. Like, like seriously, like, like, uh, like, you wonder why you can't sleep. You wonder why you're having nightmares. You know, you wonder why your husband keeps going to the computer to look at that thing. Well, quit watching Game of Thrones with him and, call, and passing it off as good plots. Right? Back in my day, that was they just read the articles. Some of y'all got that. But you, like, like you, gotta, you, you, gotta feed, you gotta feed your faith and that kind of stuff, I'm telling you, it doesn't feed your faith. It does not feed faith. Your faith. Garbage in, garbage out. So what are we putting in? What are we putting in? I'm going to tell a story about Jesus. Good guy to tell a story about, you know, especially in church. Jesus, right after he was baptized, um, he was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness. And, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, theological context that we can look at in that one little sentence. Like, the first one is, uh, right after you take your biggest step in your walk, the devil's coming after you. He's coming, okay? We're going to see some people go through baptism waters here in a little while, okay? If, you're, if that's you today, he's coming. I'll tell the rest of you, he's coming too, all right? Because you're in church this morning, and he don't like it. But he was led by the Spirit, so the Spirit's going to lead you into some dry places sometimes, so, so here's what happens when Jesus goes out into the wilderness. Satan comes and he tempts him. And the first time he's tempted, he says, hey, if you're Jesus, if you're, if you're really the son of God, why don't you tell these stones to, to become bread? You know, Jesus, you're hungry because you've been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Why, why don't you tell these stones in right here to become bread? And, and Jesus comes back and he throws Deuteronomy 8, 3 at him. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by, on every word that comes out of his mouth. Garbage in, garbage out. And then the second time, the devil took him up above Jerusalem, the holy city, and and he looks at him, he says, and he says, if you're the son of God, he says, throw yourself down from here. And we talked about this a little bit last week. He says, throw yourself down from here. And and then the devil even uses scripture. He uses, actually, he goes back in the Old Testament. Y'all know the devil knows, knows the Bible, right? And so he uses scripture out of context, And he says, hey, look, if you throw yourself down from here, it's written in Psalms that that they're not going to allow you to be harmed. So just go ahead. Just go ahead. And then Jesus comes back. And he uses Deuteronomy 6. He says, don't put the Lord your God to the test. And then then the last time the devil comes and he tempts Jesus and he he, he says, look at all the kingdoms of the world. Look at all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give them to you if you bow down and worship me. And then lastly, Jesus came with Deuteronomy 6.13. It says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then it says that the devil left him and the angels came and consoled and, and attended to Jesus. So, so in that, what, what did Jesus do? He used scripture to combat the temptation. He used scripture. And if you want to know what his MO is, it should be our MO too. But he was Jesus, Right? Like, he knew scripture. I mean, he wrote it. So it's pretty easy for him to do it, right? Well, go with me for a second on this. Because Jesus had to learn scripture just like you and I have to learn scripture. Just like I, you and I have to learn anything else. You see, it wasn't just planted in Jesus from God because he was Jesus. You know how I know that? The Bible says it. Luke 4. When Mary and Joseph traveled back, they went away from Jerusalem. They were traveling back to Nazareth. Um, Jesus was 12 years old, and all of a sudden, they get three days' journey away, and they realize, oh, we forgot our kid. (laughs) Where's he at? You know, 
I hope none of y'all ever done that, you know? <laughs> but, but like three days goes and like, oh, Jesus isn't around. Where's he at? So they go back to Jerusalem and Jesus is in the temple. And it says in that moment that he's sitting there learning and asking questions. And so let me ask you a question on this. If Jesus had to learn and ask questions, if somebody who already knows it all, why do they need to learn and ask questions? If Jesus already had it implanted in there and he knew it all, why would he need to learn and ask questions? Because the last little bit of that, it says he grew in wisdom and stature. For somebody who knows it all already, can you grow in wisdom? Can you grow if you already know it all? I know some of you guys in here think you know it all, so you should be answering right here. <laughs> you, you know, and so, so you look at that. So, so Jesus had to learn these things much like you and I have to learn these things. Jesus had to spend time reading and memorizing scripture because he knew, he knew for you and for me and for him, it was his number one tactic in battle. You see, it's hard to do better if we don't know better. You see, some people are praying for a breakthrough. They're praying for a miracle in your life. And Jesus is over there going, it's right over there. It's the Bible. Open it. Read it. You see, the thing about the Bible that's different than any other book and, and, I'll, and I'll share with you something that happened with me this week. Because I think we think we've got to memorize all 66 books to have this done. And that's just not the case. So my reading plan that I'm on, that I, I, I read through the Bible every year, all the way through it. Kind of, I do an Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm, Proverb, or every, every day. And so uh, I'm currently in the book of Jeremiah. And I was reading, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday morning of this week. And... Um, and, and I just read like the first sentence in, in the Jeremiah passage that I'm reading. It says, it says something along the lines of like, Jeremiah heard the word of the Lord. And I stopped. It, and like literally I'm sitting there going, I was like, man, how in tune with God the, the, was Jeremiah? For that's the first thing that, you, that I read this morning is Jeremiah heard the word of the Lord. Because I think we kind of gloss over those things and we look at it and then we try to read what Jeremiah heard from God. But no, 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 no. The thing that spoke to me that morning was just that Jeremiah heard from the word. He heard from the Lord. And that was it. Like that, that was just, and I was sitting there going, I was like, man, and he was walking with God. He was in tune with what God was saying. And it challenged me in my life. Like that little bit challenged me. So here's, here's the super practical thing that you can do, whether you're a follower of Jesus or, 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 or not, today. I'm, I'm giving you this. This is super easy and super practical. Y'all ready? Here it is. 888. Write that down. Eight, the number 888. We thought about using 666, but it probably wouldn't go well in the church. <laughs> so 888, okay? 888. Y'all ready? Here's what the first eight is. And anybody can use this. This is for everybody. The masses. Eight hours of sleep. Do your best. Try to get eight hours of sleep. I started recently, um, I bought an app on my phone, and it, and it ties to this cool Michael Knight, uh, Knight Rider watch that I got. Um, and so, um, and so it, it tracks my sleep. The only bad thing is I got to wear my watch when I sleep, which is like annoying and I can't stand it. And, but it tracks my sleep. It tells me like how long I slept. It tells me uh, how good of a sleep I got. It tells me what, when my rim was. It tells, me, um, it, it tells me all these things about my sleep, what my heartbeat was during my sleep, to know if I'm still alive while I'm sleeping. Um, and so all this stuff, and, and I was shocked. I'm sitting here thinking, I was like, man, I go to bed early. Like when I say early, I mean like probably earlier than most of y'all get home, okay? And so like, I'm sitting there thinking, but I get up early. And so I'm sitting there thinking, I say, yeah, I get this. And, and like, I come to find out, like, I don't get as much sleep as I thought I did. And so I'm like, man, I need to, I need to do better. You know, I need to do better. I need to turn, I can't get eight hours of sleep. Uh, well, you know, on average, the, every person in here on average spends about five hours a day in front of some sort of screen. No, that's on average. Not, I say everybody. Not everybody does that. That's an average of, of the 
people. So there's room to get some sleep. Okay? Eight hours of sleep. The second eight. Eight glasses of water. Eight glasses of water. Now, I, I know what some of y'all are saying. Man, I can't do eight glasses of water. I'd be running to the bathroom all day long. Well, you get used to it, okay? But the benefits that water has in your life is phenomenal. Like, like I don't know if you've ever studied, like, what water does to your body, okay? But, but like, it, 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 it takes oxygen. It helps take oxygen through your blood to the different parts of your body. It helps your heart work better. It, it, it flushes your, your body out. It helps get rid of waste. For all you ladies and maybe some men, it helps your skin look pretty. Like there's so many things that water does for you. Like, like here's the thing. Y'all know how good water is? If someone's been in a desert for a long time, you know what they're not saying when they come in? I need a Coke. I just need a Coke. No, what are they saying? Water. Water. Not to mention... If you go to a restaurant, man, you know how much money you can save if you order water? Wow. <laughs> so it's crazy. It's crazy. The second eight was water. The third eight, the third eight is your first and last eight minutes. Your first and last eight minutes. Spend it with God. Rick Warren, who's a, um, an author, pastor, many of you probably have maybe have read uh, his most popular book is the... Um, Purpose Driven Life, 40, day, 40 Days of Purpose. Phenomenal book. I've done it probably five or six times. Um, but but um, he says this. He says, I charge my phone in a different room. He goes, I don't use an alarm clock. Uh, but I keep my Bible open on my nightstand next to my bed. He goes, so it's the first thing I see when I wake up in the morning. And it's the last thing I see when I go to bed at night. I don't turn the TV on after I read. Because I want to spend the first and last with Jesus. First eight minutes, the last eight minutes. And like I said, you look at like what I did the other day, like in the book of Jeremiah, I just probably less, it probably wasn't even a sentence. It was probably just Jeremiah heard from the, heard from the Lord, comma, and then they said it, or colon, and then they said it. And so I'm sitting there going like, I didn't, it took that little bitty phrase to just wreck me. And you're looking at that, like, that's so why I say, I think we, we get defeated in trying to read our Bible because we think we got to read a certain amount every day. You don't. You don't. Go read John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept, and think about the implications that it has of how empathetic Jesus was. How he cared. And then he cares that much for you, and he cares that much for me. You see, we can't fight this battle without weapons. We can't fight this battle without the weapons at our disposal. And the greatest weapon we have is Scripture. The greatest weapon we have is Scripture. And I always think of Scripture as, I, I say it uh, in jest sometimes, I say it kind of, to be funny, I talk about scripture bombs that, you know, when somebody's going through a hard time in their life, someone comes in with like this, this out of context scripture and they kind of throw it on the top of stuff and say, hey, you know, you know, God will get you through this. Well, I don't really feel like it right now. Okay. But, um, but, but really when the devil's tempting us, it is a bomb. It's kind of like a mic drop. I don't have a mic or I'd kind of show y'all like walk off stage, but my mic's attached to my ear. So I can't really do that. I have to drop my head. But like, 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 that's what scripture is. It's a bomb. It is a weapon of mass destruction on top of the devil's head. And so when God's trying to tell me, and he, or uh, the devil's trying to tell me, he's saying, look, God doesn't love you. Look what you did. Look what you've done. We come back and we say, uh-uh. No. God still loved the world, and Mickey's a part of the world. And that God gave his only son for for. for for us, for me. And whoever believes that will have everlasting life through him. When, when the devil's trying to say, he's like, just, just, it's not going to hurt anybody. Just go ahead and take, take a look at it. I said, no, no, no. I'm like, I want to be like Job. I want to make a covenant with my eyes. 
The devil's trying to tell me, he's like, oof, today's going to be a bad day. Mm, I don't know, it's going to be a bad day. I get to say, no, uh today's the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Like, see, it's not, you don't have to memorize the whole Bible. You just got to remember the bombs you need. You got to fight fire with fire because every day is a battle. Every day is a battle. Pele, one of the greatest soccer players to ever live, said this about showing up ready to play. He says, you got to figure out what it takes to suit up. So when you show up, you're at your best. You see, we aren't ready to face the game until we get our game face on. And that's what that last eight is about. It's about getting our game face on. And once we get all that in place, I'm going to leave you at the same place we left off last week. You got to keep showing up. You got to keep showing up. Because look, there's going to be days where you don't feel like it. All right? There's going to be days when you don't feel like it. When you want to hit that snooze button. And all of a sudden, that, last, that first eight minutes got swallowed up by your last eight minutes of sleep. It's going to happen. But you got to keep showing up. You got to keep showing up. Michael Phelps, the greatest Olympian to ever live, said, his coach said this about it. He says, one thing that separates Michael from other swimmers is that if they don't feel good, they don't go swim. That's not the way it is for Michael. Michael performs no matter what he's feeling. And he's practiced that for a long time. You see, the Bible doesn't tell us necessarily how to feel on a day-to-day basis. It tells us what to do. And it says, keep showing up. Keep fighting the fight. Keep getting back on that bull. Keep getting back on that wagon. Keep showing up. Keep working in the eights. Keep showing up. Father, this, this morning, I thank you. I thank you that we, we have this opportunity to celebrate you. Father, when the devil is attacking and he's trying his hardest to keep us from showing up, God, help us to make the decision in our hearts and our minds and our lives to continue to show up. Father, I thank you that you didn't stop at 80% for us. Father, I thank you you gave it all. God, help us to continue and to fight the fight, to see that breakthrough, even when we don't feel like it, even when we're against all odds and our backs against the wall, God, help us to keep showing up. Father, I thank you in your name. Amen.